Uh, we're in the series, All Things New, and I'm excited today about this message. Two weeks ago, we talked about all things new. God's grace is offered to all of us, and to, all we have to do is receive that grace. And God sees us as we will become, not as we are, and that's good news. Last week, we talked about God has a purpose for each of us. Today, I want to continue that, and I want to really challenge us as a church this year to live more with spiritual sight than just physical sight. I want to talk about spiritual sight today. Samuel, Samuel's at the end of his life. He's blind. He goes to Bethlehem to pick a new king. And Jesse's oldest son walks in. And his oldest son looks physically like a king. And God says, no, Samuel, that's not the one. And then seven more come through. Seven sons in all. And God says no to all of them, even though they look physically like kings. And then there's little David comes running in the room, an afterthought, an afterthought, and God says, he's the one. Samuel records this. He says, the Lord doesn't see things the way we see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. My prayer for us this year, as all things are new, is that God would allow us to live seeing things spiritually more than just physically. Because physically, we can be intimidated, we can be overwhelmed with fear with the things that we see around us physically. But if God begins to give us spiritual sight, amazing things can happen. Too often, we operate on physical sight and not spiritual sight. And as adults, as we grow older, we can lose our faith. I love this. Dr. J.A. Holmes said this, Never tell anyone it can't be done. Never tell anyone it can't be done. He says, because God may have been waiting for centuries for somebody ignorant enough of the impossible to do that very thing. Too often there comes a point in our lives where we start focusing on what we can't do rather than what we can do. Can you remember the days when you liked to draw? Do you remember showing off your artwork to your parents, eager to hear those magic words? That's really good when it probably wasn't really good. Can you recall those innocent days when you felt unafraid to attempt new things? For many, the day that we discovered that we couldn't do certain things was junior high, right? That's about the same time little boys stop wearing bath towels around their necks pretending to be Superman because it's just not cool anymore. We learn early that there are such things as bad drawings and bad questions. Researchers have discovered that little children, on average, laugh over 300 times a day. And as adults, we may reach 20 times a day. When I asked my daughter when she was young, uh, what, what's your favorite color, Larissa? What's your favorite color? She, she thought about it and said, Daddy, my favorite color is red, blue, yellow, orange, green, and black. Because she hadn't learned yet that she could only have one favorite color. So how do you go? How do we go from a full-color children's world to a rusty, rutted, routine adult world? There's a sign on an Alaska highway that reads, Choose your rut carefully. You'll be in it for the next 200 miles. <laughs> you see, God says, have faith as a child. Have faith of a child. And children see things differently than we do as adults. You see... Is our world supposed to shrink as we grow bigger? Shouldn't growing older make me bolder instead of shrinking back? Art Linkletter once said this, I've learned that growing older is a privilege, but growing old is a choice. I love this. Gordon McKenzie wrote his delightful little book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. It's a classic, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. After working as the creative director of Hallmark Cards, uh, he, he visited elementary schools to teach creative thinking, and when he entered the first grade, he said this. He would say, how many artists are in the room? And everybody would raise their hands. He says, by the time it got to fifth grade, there were only a few hands going up. And the question is, what happens between first grade and fifth grade that convinces all of us that we're not artists and that we cannot draw? What happens as we grow older? We think we, we can't draw. We can't speak. We can't do math because our parents had bad, bad math genes and passed them on to us. And when people in authority repeatedly tell us you can't control your anger, you can't learn, you can't make good decisions, you can't be good, have, get, have good grades, you can't do anything, we begin to believe it. How do we change 
our physical sight to a more spiritual sight and view. One of my favorite verses, and we shared it a couple weeks ago, but one of my favorite verses, many of us know it, but this is what it says, and we have to believe it, friends. We have to. Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This means I can do everything that God calls me to do. God has never given you or myself a command or commission for which he has not also given me the power and the resources and the people to get it done. I think God is calling Life Community Church more than ever this year to begin to see with spiritual sight rather than just physical sight. I can do everything I'm supposed to do through Christ. And Paul, who wrote that, was a student of the prophets. And he may have been thinking about what Habakkuk wrote when he says in Habakkuk chapter 2, this is God. He says, I will give you my message in the form of vision. Write it clearly enough to be read at a glance. Know the vision. The vision of the church is to love. Because love, as the song said, is bigger than anything in its way. Love, love uh, covers a multitude of sins. At the end, love wins. Love is, is, is who God is. And that's the vision, to love. And then he says, at the time I have decided, my words will come true. He says, I, you can trust what I say about the future. We can trust God. We can do all things through Christ. This is the hardest part, though, at the end of Habakkuk. It says this. You can trust God. You can trust his vision. You go for it. You put your life in his hands. But this last part bugs me. It says, but it may take a long time. But keep on. It will happen. I want it to happen today. But God says, this is the walk of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. One of the enemies of accomplishing what God has called us to do are what uh, we call critics. There are, anybody have any critics in your life? Many times critics come from within the church and not so much outside the church. Turkey raising experts say that if a turkey gets wounded or has a spot of blood on its feathers, the other turkeys will peck at that spot until that peck, until they peck that wounded turkey to death. Isn't that sad? Sorry, I've just bummed all of you out with that picture. But, th but I was thinking about it. It's not the big wounds that kill our spirit. I know this is true. I know this is true in my life. Pastoring for 23 years at one place and God did amazing things always when we would just take risks and step out. But I learned over time, it's the thousands of little cuts that add up over time. Face it, if we're going to do anything great, we will attract critics. And many times our roughest critics can be those closest to us or maybe those that should be supporting us. Remember, the only place Jesus did not perform miracles was his hometown. It's the only place. Because people could not see past the boy, Jesus, to believe that the man could do for them what he had been doing for everyone else. Let's go back to King David. One of the greatest heroes in biblical history certainly found this to be true. He grew up the youngest of eight brothers. When Israel needed a new king, God sent the priest Samuel to visit uh, David's uh, father, Jesse. Samuel informed Jesse that one of his sons would become the king of Israel. Jesse proceeded to proceed his... He, uh, parade his seven oldest boys for Samuel to inspect. And one after one, they tried to make a good impression, yet one after another, God said, he's not the one. Samuel finally looked at Jesse and said, are these all the sons you have? This is it, he replied. This is it. And then like an afterthought, he goes, oh, wait, 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 there is one more. It's always nice to be the youngest and forgotten and he says, I forgot about David, but it, it can't be David. David can't be the next king. He's tending sheep. And with that single phrase, but he's tending sheep, Jesse said it all. David not only brought up the chronological rear in his family, his father considered him the son with the least obvious potential. Sometimes we compare ourselves to other churches or we compare ourselves to other people and we say, what, what, what good? can I do? What good could we do? They said it about Jesus. What good could come out of Nazareth? But in fact, David was the very man God had been looking for. David not only became a great battler and a great king, God called him a man after his own heart. Be careful who you listen to. 
God's got amazing things for this church. God's got amazing things for your life, but we must see spiritually more than we see physically. If we listen to our critics, we'll be nothing, we'll have nothing, we'll enjoy nothing, but worse of all, we might miss the mission for which God has created us. God has created us to do great things. That's not egotistic. It's because God, we were made in God's image. If we listen to our critics, we might miss out on what God has called us for. Fred Smith, the founder of Federal Express, had this idea in college of an overnight delivery system while he was studying business at Yale University. He wrote about it in a research paper and he received a C grade. And his professor said, the concept is interesting, but in order to earn a better grade than a C, the idea must be feasible. And then the rest is history as we know it. See, this is the problem when we're walking by sight and not by faith. Feasible, reasonable, rational, pay no attention to the vocabulary of the little people who love those words. Feasible, reasonable, rational. One of the things that you have to do in life is learn to live and ignore those kind of words. See, people compare us to others from the moment we're born. We're weighed, we're measured, we're judged by everyone else. Maybe God calls you and God calls me to be unique, and to walk by faith. David certainly, again, illustrated this point. On one occasion, Jesse sent David to take food to his brothers. We know this story. They, along with the army of Israel, were faced with their dreaded enemies, the Philistines. And when David arrives, he discovers that no one wants to go out and fight the Philistines' super warrior, Goliath. David assesses the situation, little David, and he decides to volunteer for the job. I will take that man down. He reports to King Saul to inform him that he is ready to fight. You're ready to go. I got a vision from God. I'm going to take this guy on. And you know what Saul says? Don't be ridiculous. How can a kid like you fight with a man like him? You are only a boy, and he has been in the army since he was a boy. But the Bible says this, David persisted. He persisted. He said, no, is there not a cause? This man is mocking our God. Is there not a cause? David refused to live by someone else's measurement of what he could do. And he found out quickly that there's not much of a crowd in the extra mile. He's out there. He's out there with a slingshot. And Goliath and everyone else is hiding behind him. From the start, David's family wrote him off. Then he faced sharp ridicule as Goliath compared him to a dog. But at the end of the day, David literally had Goliath's head. Literally. David had faith eyes. I just want us to think about this in our own lives, personally and as a church. Faith eyes. Faith eyes. Do we see spiritually? And do we, do we really believe that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us? And yet David had faith eyes, yet one more thing here. The going didn't instantly get much easier. In a short while, King Saul, the very guy whose battle David fought and won, considered David his rival. His main competition, Saul hated David. It didn't help to hear the people singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Each time Saul heard that refrain, anger burned in his heart. David spent years on the run and hiding, all because the very person whose kingdom he had saved now saw David as a competitor. David spent years on this run, and even though David posed no threat to Saul, Saul kept trying to kill David. You're anointed king, you're trying to live by faith, and the person you supported and defended is now trying to kill you. If you want to do something great in life, stop hanging around negative people, hoping for positive outcomes. you got to move forward. Romans says this, Romans says, I urge you to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. When God calls us to move forward, maybe people get jealous, maybe people will put us down, but we must keep moving forward. You, 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 I don't mean to point, but you, you have too much important stuff to do. We, I, have too much important stuff to do than to get dragged down by small-minded people. Get away from people who have no heroes, champion no causes, and acknowledge no accomplishments. While Jesus said this, love your neighbor as yourself. Huge. That's our calling, to love our neighbor as ourself. But he also said, do not cast your pearls before swines. 
If you get around people who believe enough in you to place great expectations on you, you might just accomplish greatness. I remember when I started at my church, it was was just a small ragtag band of people, and we began to dream, and we began to think, maybe God can use us. What good could come out of Placerville? Yeah, that's been asked quite a few times. (laughs) But God began to bless us, not not because we were trying to be someone else, but because we just said, God, let us dream big. Let us dream big when it comes to fighting sex trafficking. Let us dream big when it comes to serving the homeless. Let us, let us dream big when it comes to reaching people who don't know about the grace of Jesus. And when you begin to dream and you begin to say, God, you said we can do all things. God begins to do miracles. God did not create you to crown you with mediocrity. Let me just say that again. I, you know... I wasn't going to preach this message this week, and then yesterday I said, i got to, I got to do something different here because I know you need to hear this and I need to hear this. God did not create us, and he did not crown us with mediocrity. He created you and crowned you with glory, with his glory, with his glory. Let me just read this. This is, this is it. Psalm 8 says, God, what were are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Friends, if you forget everything else today, I need you to leave here today knowing this. You bear God's image. And I don't care what anyone else says. God created you and breathed into you and you were born to achieve and you were born to enjoy this adventure called life and life everlasting. Let me just say it again. You bear his image. I don't care what your parents, I don't care what your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors said. You bear God's image. God created you and breathed life into you, and he's got great plans for you. He's got great plans for us. So what can we do? Let me get practical here for just a few moments. How can we live by faith and not by sight? How can we have a more spiritual sight as we go into this next year? Let me just give you three thoughts real quick, okay? Three thoughts. One, this year, give God your best. Give God your best. Put him first. First things first. Put him first. Contrary to popular opinion, you are responsible only for being the best you can be. God does not expect us to excel at being someone else. God made you an original. God has unique, awesome plans for you. But before you excel at anything, you must acknowledge that you have something to offer, someone to please, and someone who gives permission to live it all out. And God has something for you to offer. There are no mistakes. Think about the power of the promise found in Daniel chapter 11. The people who know their God shall be strong and do great things. Friends, we're not just hanging on until Jesus comes back. He's, as we talked two weeks ago and last week, he's given us keys to the kingdom, all authority and power. God loves you. God loves you and takes great pleasure in watching your confidence grow. You're his child. Don't we love to see our children grow? Don't we love to see our children succeed? Make it your major preoccupation to be everything you can be. Excel at being you. John Steinbeck once wrote, it is the nature of man to rise to greatness if greatness is expected of him. But before you excel, you must believe that God has wonderfully and fearfully made you. And he has given you amazing gifts to offer this world. The cross, the cross has become the symbol of excellence of the Christian gospel. God took a symbol of suffering and shame and transformed it into a symbol of love and sacrifice. He changed the ultimate place of pain, humiliation, and rejection into the place where God at his best offered himself for man at his worst. Can any response to that amazing love be anything but God, here is my best. Here is my best time. Here is my best talents. Here are my best treasures. If it bears God's name, it deserves the best. It deserves the best. The world is crying out for the church to be relevant, for the church to be loving, for the church to be a place, a safe haven, to know that God loves them. So God is asking the church, no leftovers, no scraps from the table. Give him your best. Give him your first. 
This is the second thing, and I only have three, so this is the second one. The first one is give God your best. Give God your best this year. The second thing is rise above opposition, because there will be opposition when we want to do great things, when we dream big for God. The truth is this. The truth is this. This is so, I'm, so, I'm such a deep person, but here it is. It's much easier to live a life of mediocrity, I have found. It just is. You fly under the radar, and everybody, nobody really pays attention to you. You know, you know why I like to live in mediocrity? Because it excuses me from suffering, sacrifice, and setbacks. I just kind of cruise into heaven. Consider one more example of King David. Saul spent years chasing after David to kill him. One night, David and his army discovered Saul unguarded and asleep in the cave. This is such a great story. Saul's trying to kill David, and then David comes on Saul, and Saul's sleeping. And so David's commanders urge David, go in and kill him. Go in and kill him. Then you'll be king, and this whole nightmare will be over. And David says, I'm not going to kill him uh, because he's still king. Besides, I have a better plan. (laughs) I have a better plan. What I've got in mind for Saul will be much worse for him than death. And that is he'll know that I was there. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so David moves quietly in the cave for a few moments, and then he comes out running like a little kid playing doorbell ditch with a little piece of Saul's garment. He says, see what's in my hand? He yells this so Saul hears it. It's the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. Doesn't this convince you that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting for my life? The Lord will decide between us. Perhaps he will kill you for what you were trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. David says, I'm not going to, I'm going to rise above the opposition. I'm not going to go down to your standards. I'm not going to get caught up with revenge and hatred and bitterness towards my critics. It just drains me. He simply says, at the end of the day, we'll just let the fruit of our lives stand and defend. God is my judge and God is my defender. As God calls us to do great things and to live by faith and not by sight, what he says is, give God your best and rise above the opposition. Don't lower yourself. God, the Bible says God is our advocate. Hebrews says, for Christ has entered into heaven itself to appear now before God as our advocate. We do not have to have revenge. We do not have to have hate. Rise above it. Rise above it. I'll never forget this story from Pastor Bill Hybels. He was 20 years into pastoring, and he was burnt out. And he loved pastoring, but he was tired and weary. And he wasn't sure, and he was overworking, and the church had grown. And so he went to his elders, and he says, I I need a month. I need a month to just disappear and wrestle with God and refuel. And they said, go for it. So he announced it to his congregation that Sunday. You won't see me for a month. And he, he was real transparent at the end of the message, a businessman came up to him and said, you know, pastor, you may just not be cut out for this. He says, you know, I've been in business for 40 years and I haven't taken one vacation. So you just might not be cut, you might not be strong enough for this. So poor Bill, for a month, that thing is rattling in his head. You might not be made for this. You're too weak for that whole month. And he came back on his first week back, he gives a message, and at the end of the message, this businessman comes forward. Bill's like, oh, great. And the guy goes, hey, Bill, I just, I don't know if you remember what I said last month. Yeah, yeah, more than I wish. He says, hey, I just want to apologize. Um, I was just having a bad day. And Bill goes, I almost quit the ministry over someone else's bad day. Don't do that. Rise above your critics. Rise above your opposition. I mean, David could have said, this isn't worth being king because the king now is trying to kill me. Rise above that. Rise above it. And then the last one is this. Give God your best. Rise above your critics. And then the last one, and this one is, is, is really the key, and that is prevail, endure. Don't give up. Don't give up. God promises his children this, that we can endure against all odds. In Isaiah 54, it says, Weapons made to attack you won't be successful. Words spoken against you won't hurt at all. My servants, I, the Lord, promise to bless you with victory. But we must not give up. When you place your confidence in God, 
you can prevail in the face of any opposition or any discouragement. There's a quote, and I don't know who, I don't know who quoted I couldn't find who quoted it, so I'll just take credit. This is my quote. No, it's, it's not. It's, it says this. It says, knowing that nothing gets to you, knowing that nothing gets to you until it gets through him should make you bold and unafraid. Isn't that a great quote? I, I wrote it yesterday. Uh, knowing that nothing gets to you until it gets through him should make you bold and unafraid. Church, we have been given the keys to the kingdom, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And God is saying, let's see by faith and not so much by sight anymore. The Bible says in Colossians, the hope of glory is this, God in us. That's the hope of glory. God lives in us. Not God and us, not God with us, but God in us, the Bible says. And we can do everything that we're supposed to do through him who strengthens us. Everything. God's going to do miracles this year if we live even more by faith and not by sight. You know, God will give us the power and the strength and uh, the influence to love every person we, we, we need to love this year. We can do every job we ought to be doing because God lives in us. We can pray every prayer that we ought to be praying. We can storm the gates of hell, forgive a brutal wound, serve the hungry and poor, fight for people beaten up by injustice. We can do all things through Christ who lives in us, who strengthens us. We can do it all. And I find great comfort in David's psalm in Psalm 40 that says this. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the miry clay, He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. I will sing. He says, I will sing a new song. It's a new day. All things are new. And God has positioned this church and us as individuals in this new year to walk by faith and not by sight. And when I get fearful and I get lazy or I get comfortable, and boy, I get fearful and lazy and comfortable very quickly. I know you don't, but I do. When I'm tempted not to give my best, when I'm tempted to just live a mediocre life, I read this. I read this all the time. Theodore Roosevelt in 1899 wrote this. Far better to dare mighty things to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits whose neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory and not defeat. This is my prayer. My prayer today is that Life Community Church, as a family and as individuals, may we have the eyes of Samuel. May we have the eyes of Samuel. For God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks within. God calls us to follow him and to give our lives with full abandon. Passionately, no turning back. Helen Keller was right when she said, one can never creep when one feels the impulse to roar. Her words remind me of one of my favorite scriptures, Isaiah 40, that says this. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even young people grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who wait and hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Will you pray? Will you pray a dangerous prayer with me right now? Some of you are like, depends what it is. (laughs) This is the prayer. Dear Lord, let me attempt to do something so great with my life that I'm doomed for failure unless you're in it. Ooh. Some of you are saying, let me pray about whether I want to pray that prayer. (laughs) Dear Lord, let me attempt to do something so great with my life that I'm doomed for failure unless you're in it. God's will, God's will is this. This is Jesus' prayer, that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, we're not just hanging on. God does not have a theology of just hanging on. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. I like that one. Give God your best. Don't let anyone discourage you. Endure. 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 May we walk by faith and not by sight.
I want to close with a poem that I wrote. And I wrote this because I, uh, I, as I grow older, I just, I, I love, I want to have the faith of a child. I want to have the energy of a child, huh? That's not so much happening, but I want to have the faith of a child. I want to have the faith of a child because children live better by faith than we do. And Jesus says, have, have a childlike faith. I was talking to the staff this week, and we were like, what did you want to do when you were a kid? What were your passions and your dreams? I mean, we dreamt about it all. So I just wrote this because the Bible says this, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. And that we've been adopted into God's family and that we are his children. That's why my favorite song is, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Because I'm not going to walk by sight anymore, but I'm going to walk by faith. Because I am a child of God. I wrote this a little while ago. It's just called The Wonder of a Child. When a child wakes up to the morning dew with abandoned wonder, she asks, what adventures will be new? The day awaits with endless opportunities, fully in the moment, leads to no worries. The adventures of a child. When a child ventures outside, the world has no limit. Fantasies and possibilities, new trails where no one has seen it. The days last forever, not wanting it to end. I'm the king of the world with sun-blistered skin. The potential of a child. One day the president, the next day a queen. No hesitation, no debate, just fearless dreams. No regret of yesterday, no thought of tomorrow. Skin, knees, surface tears, short-lived sorrow. The dreams of a child. Every child is an artist, every child an engineer, a CEO, a movie star, a scientist, a musketeer, a world traveler, a hero, an all-star athlete. They almost always win, yet not afraid of defeat. The courage of a child. I sleep impatiently on a plane hoping to get quickly from here to there. A child presses her nose against the window, staring, cooing, spellbound by what she might see in the air. Every moment a chance to learn, every second fully alive, enraptured by the present while I'm anxiously waiting to arrive. The curiosity of a child. The world says, grow up, sober up, don't think so wild, yet a very great man. Our Redeemer, Jesus said, you must return to the faith of a child. A faith that trusts, a faith that asks a million questions, a faith that wakes up every day with hope, serenity, and no reservations. The faith of a child. As we sing this song, will you just kind of say, God, I want to give you my best. May you pray that prayer. God, let me do something so great that if you're not in it, it will fail. God, may I walk better by faith and not just by sight. Let's, let's sing this song. And there are always... Uh, people available. If you need prayer during this time, this is just our reflection time at the end of the service that we do each week where if you need prayer, you can pray in your seat. You can pray. Uh, some of our prayer team will, will come forward during the song and then I'll close us when we're done.